Hello, nerds. Welcome to History Nerds United Podcast Special Edition. Let me talk to you, nerds. Here's what went on. You know Dr. James Kirby Martin. He came on the podcast before to talk about his book, Surviving Dresden. We talked about it, a little bit about war and all of the things that come along with that. And Jim was feeling a lot of feelings about Ukraine, just like I was. And he said, let's talk about it. Let, let's compare it with the novel. Let's talk about how things are the same, how things are different. Let's just kind of dive into it. And I said, let's go. Let's do it. You're about to hear it. We had a really, really good conversation. I'm happy to be able to kind of talk about something that's a bit more current events. But let me be clear. We're not diving into contemporary American politics. I refuse to. I don't want to. It's not worth it. So... If you are listening to hear us, bad mouth, Biden, Trump, any of those people, it's not going to happen. That is not what we're doing. We're looking at something that is happening right now. And le let me be very clear. We are taking a side. Go Ukraine. Keep it up, everybody. But we're not going to start throwing people under the bus and say this guy should have done this and this guy should have done this. It's not what we're doing. Now let's just shut up and let you hear what we actually do talk about. James Kirby Martin talking about his book, Surviving Dresden and how it relates to Ukraine. All right, welcoming back to the podcast, Dr. James Kirby Martin. Jim, lovely to have you back. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, these are trying times we're living in. And uh, we have a major war going on in the area of Ukraine. And we're going to talk about that a little bit and try to do that within the context of some information we can glean from World War II, because there is a connection. Let me, let me put it this way for our audience. And that is what we do get on a daily way uh, are reports. This happened, that happened, this city got hit, that particular action took place. These uh, civilians have uh, uh, gotten out of town, so to speak, and uh, uh, they become refugees. They've gone off to Poland, all those kinds of issues. But we don't really get much perspective out of that. And that's one of the things that I'm interested in. We can reach back in the grab bag of history. And we can look in that bag, and what we're going to find is that uh, as warfare has developed over time, and especially going all the way back to World War II now, 80, 90 years uh, backward looking, uh, that there are certain things that we can pick out that may help us better understand what is going on in Ukraine today in relation to the war with uh, Putin's Russia. So that's what I'd like to do. Well, Jim, let's talk about context, too, right? And the listeners know you as the writer of Surviving Dresden, right, about World War II, the bombing of Dresden. That was a historical fiction book. And now we're talking about current events. So what I want to do is please tell the listeners kind of, uh, I believe it's called your CV, so they kind of understand what you're coming from, what your expertise is as you kind of discuss these larger concepts in relation to Ukraine. Well, my background goes back fairly long way. I actually uh, earned a PhD degree in uh, U.S. history uh, way back in 1969, as a matter of fact, uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Studied with some of the best professors at that time in the United States. And my fields of interest there, primary field, was the American Revolution with a secondary emphasis on 20th century. And I was particularly interested in war and diplomacy uh, in, in that particular area. Um, I taught for 49 years at academic institutions, including Rutgers University for several years in New Jersey, the University of Houston. I had a, a semester appointment as a visiting distinguished professor at the Citadel in uh, South Carolina, Charleston. And I spent a year, my last teaching year, as a matter of fact, as a visiting professor at the United States Military Academy at West Point. So the point about that is I've done a lot of thinking, writing, teaching in relation to subjects that touch upon uh, military history. I try to put a lot of that together in a curious way in this, this novel, which uh, is titled Surviving Dresden, and, and then the subtitle is Life, Death, and Redemption and during World War II. And the story of Dresden is a story of a massive bombing campaign. And bombing is a very important issue when we switch over and talk about Ukraine. We're going to look at some of the uh, issues about what's going on. We see cities being torn up. We see buildings being blown up. That all has to do with bombing, some from the air, but mostly in the case of Ukraine from the ground. Then we want to take into consideration how all of this kind of technological warfare activity, which has become very, very sophisticated in the last century, 
how that then relates to, well, I'd say just focus on the civilian population, which is a major issue, which we hear about over and over again. Very concerned about uh, civilians being killed. And we want to look at that kind of an issue and look at it furthermore, I think, in the context of what we call just war theory, uh, which is a theoretical basis for the kinds of things that are perhaps happening and going on and would, I believe, help enrich our understanding uh, and give us more perspective on the actual nature of this contest. And we might even ask in the end, what I think is a very important question, we know that World War II toward the end, uh, we can describe with terms like total war. Everybody's fighting everybody else. And ultimately, if you get into the Japanese side, you're going to be dropping atomic bombs. Now, if the atomic bomb is in total war, I don't know what it is. In the case of uh, Ukraine, are we even approaching something like that? Is this actually a more limited war uh, in its nature? And I think that's a question to look at as well. I'm not denying even at the outset the possibility of atomic war could grow out of this. And Lord hopes, I hope. And we all hope that doesn't happen because that's the beginning of the end of humanity. But uh, at this point, it hasn't gone in that direction, even though there's some very sharp words that have been exchanged along that line. Uh, Remember, as Putin said at one point, I have atomic weapons like everybody had forgotten that. Uh, And then our response said is the United States and even uh, Britain and and Germany and others, they said, okay, (laughs) we know that. But they didn't really say, if some wanted them to, we got a lot of atomic weapons too, and we'll blow you up before you blow us up. And these are, again, the kind of things that uh, I think it's important to uh, take into consideration and getting a sense of maybe where we are. And then I would also add to that uh, is how do you stop the killing? That's a major theme in the novel about the bombing of Dresden in 1945, How do you stop the killing when the killing won't stop? Well, starting from square one, I know when this all started, I decided to uh, reach into my little history mind and think about how this looks a lot like appeasement from World War II. I talked about it on the website. I didn't necessarily say this was appeasement, but I did say that there's definitely shadows of World War II with Hitler, with appeasement, like you're talking about where they're here in the footsteps and they don't want everything to go too far. And I'm wondering from, we've already established your credentials as a very big deal. What's appeasement? What was it in World War II? And are we talking about the same thing right now? Well, first, uh, what is appeasement? There's a very simple definition, I think, that we all would agree to, and that is Appeasement is making certain decisions to try to avoid conflict or further conflict or growing conflict. To to avoid conflict would be the, I believe, a very brief way to to carry the point. So what is it? That's what we're trying to do. Does it work in avoiding conflict is a a follow-up kind of a question. And based on our experiences in going into World War II, generally speaking, we would say not. Hitler had a grand dream, Lebensraum. He wants to take everything. You know, he wants to build the Aryan a thousand year whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, and that dream is there with him. And he, and he also uh, has other reasons for what he's trying to do. Uh, and you have Neville Chamberlain from the British in 1938. He is the prime minister. And his concern is legitimately how can we avoid a bigger conflict? Because Hitler's talking about taking the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia is in the background and all of this. And uh, there there are other areas that he is interested in taking. And these negotiations will take place. And and Chamberlain is trying to do the right thing. He said, well, if I could just pacify this guy in some way, uh, we throw a few trinkets in his drawer. Okay, take the Sudetenland. Sudetenland. We're not going to threaten you with warfare if you do that. And, and, And so... It really becomes this, this, this incredible matter of Hitler says, okay, I'll, you know, he implies I'll stop there if you just let me have a little bit. Well, did he stop there? No, he found out they, that at least the Brits and at least the French and the French are involved in the background of this aren't going to really stand up if I grab more territory. And what does he do? He keeps grabbing, grabbing, grabbing until we have the invasion of Poland on September 1st of 1939. And and, and so in this case, this is a classic example where appeasement didn't work. Why? 
we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of dictators and dictatorships, and that's, that's part of the reason. Now, if we relate that same kind of appeasement to what uh, we know about the Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin's been making noises about the Ukraine for a long time. I don't know whether I want to go too far beyond, I mean, since 2014, obviously, where there is a small invasion and certain amount of territory is taken. And what he, Putin, uh, we'll talk about him a little bit more as a person, uh, what, what he's envisioning again is kind of this Lebensraum thing, but it's not really the same thing because Hitler is utterly expansive. He wants territory that he doesn't have. In this case, we have Putin who's going after territory that once was a part uh, of the great union of socialist, uh, Soviet socialist republics. And, and so he's trying to reassemble what was. And, and he has, I believe in his mind, his understanding of history, when the, everything fell apart for the Soviet Union in 1991, the collapse occurred. We had to reverse that trend, uh, and he'll take a series of steps uh, in that direction as we move into the uh, current century. Uh, and so he is expansionist, but he's expansionist to, in essence, get back what he thought was rightfully theirs and what, uh, and what the Republic at one time, that is the so Socialist Republic, had as part of its European Asian empire. So, I, I mean, it's, it's there. Appeasement is there. And the thing with appeasement, too, is it's not a singular moment in time. You know, as you mentioned, Neville Chamberlain is the one that gets that term put around his neck for eternity. But as you mentioned, it's a much longer policy decision, just like it is now, right? And it usually covers a lot of different, whether it's, you know, administrations, parliaments, and things like that. This is not one moment in time where somebody made a decision, now it's appeasement. It's something where a lot of people um, from different sides of the aisle over an extended period of time will set up this situation where you find yourself saying, oh, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, it'll be everything will be fine, I don't want to fight. It's not a singular moment in time. That is very much the case. And part of the problem, at least as I see it, has to do with your opponent. And in the case of Hitler, again, going back to the novel, we sort of set him up as an expansionist right away. And that, that as an individual who doesn't care about human life, if you don't care about human life, you've got a real problem because you've got a dictator who's willing to kill, 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 kill for whatever that vision is out there. And Hitler fits that. I think he would say the same thing about Putin. But again, like Hitler, he's destroyed his opposition, politically speaking, and uh, there, there is no such thing. Uh, and by the nature of his experience, he grows up, and, and some people say, well, he was short, he was bullied, and all this sort of thing, and it's big payback, and I'm going to get into that kind of pop psychology. But, I, but there, may, there may be a little bit of something there, because Somewhere along the line in his experience, as he trained, went to get a college education, got a law degree, got involved in the KGB, some button either pressed or unpressed on him, I don't know which way it was, where he too doesn't care about people. That's the amazing thing. It's a characteristic of dictators. Let me ask, did Napoleon care about people? How many people died under Napoleon? I mean, when you study, when, like when we studied at West Point, at West Point, we studied Napoleon. We look at him as a great warrior, but I also look at him as a really kind of not very good human being, and I want to say a bad guy because he didn't care. Killing millions of people did not matter to him, and that's scary when you start to think about what is going on in the Ukraine. We get these reports now, and I don't know whether I have the latest one where there's an estimate, I believe it was something last time I heard that four or five Ukrainian people have been killed as compared to like 15,000 or so Russian soldiers were playing that were playing the kill numbers and the kill game, which is, which is obviously worth knowing about. But as, as we do this, what will encourage Putin as the war slows down and seems to turn a little bit in the Zelensky direction, what will Putin do? Because he's now into this. Is he going to engage in more killing? And so that gets into another subject about technology and then how we're going to use our weaponry. The amazing thing is, if, if you study these people, and someone, there's a 
Great book to be done on commonalities among dictators because they're readily identifiable. They want power. They want it all. And they don't want opposition. And if you take that into consideration and you take that they're sociopathic in the sense they don't care about human life, maybe they do care about their own or maybe their immediate surroundings and families. But beyond that, they really don't care. Hitler was a master at this. He didn't care. The thousands were dying. He didn't care about 6 million Jews. He didn't care about all the others' millions that were being killed and slaughtered all over the place because he still had his dream. And his dream was more important than all those human lives. And that's a perversion from my point of view. And I, I see some of that in the uh, current situation uh, with respect to the Ukraine. In the case of Putin, lives don't matter to him. What matters to him is the power. And what matters to him is to having this territory. Talk, go back to appeasement. Will this be the last one he wants? My money is no, it's not. Because as you said, he is- <laughs> Thank you, my money is a no, no, no. I mean, especially his propaganda, and I'd love to talk about that next, right? The the difference between Nazi propaganda and now what Putin is putting out there. I mean, what I love, I absolutely love, he's getting rid of anti-Semites, according to him. Right. But I believe Zelensky is Jewish. It, it sounds very much like what Hitler or any of these, you know, terrible dictators, they will make stuff up and they'll say the masses are stupid enough to fall for this and they want to fall for it. And I'm just going to tell them. I mean, there there is that line, right, where these Hitler, Putin, let's just tell them what they want to hear. Tell them that they're the good guys, that we're doing the right thing so that way we can stay in power and we can do what we want. I'll give you this example. 1945, the point of all this bombing that is going on is to break the German will. And this, the, 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 literally the country is being destroyed by this. And, and uh, the major cities are being hammered to, uh, to death as are people being uh, you know, slaughtered. And what you have in the case of Dresden is that after these bombing runs, no one knows how many have been killed. They just know it's a lot. So in that situation, a good propagandist will make up a number and it's not gonna be a low number. And they, they specifically under Ger Goebbels, leadership on this, and whether he was literally there, I don't know, or at least calling from Berlin or whatever bunker he was hiding in at that point, I don't know, was you pile the bodies, stack them as high as you possibly can, take a picture, and then you make up your number. Uh, and the number that Goebbels came up with was a little over 200,000. And then some other people are like, ah, 200,000, it was nothing, it was 500,000. And this actually works its way into the post-war analysis of what happened in Dresden. And historians, some of them, concerned about peace or a particular kind of a message. I'm thinking of a guy like David Irving, who was, uh, you know, myth of the six million type of a writer. They start using these numbers and say, look, this was worse than bombing Hiroshima. Uh, you know, Hiroshima was 80,000, but 200,000 or 150,000 or uh, died in Dresden, all that sort of thing. That's all propaganda. In this case, it even works its way into history and historical analysis. And it makes a real difference now in how some of us look back, not me, but how some people look back at uh, World War II. And rather than being a war of liberation against some of the worst tyrannies in the history of humanity, it really becomes a war in which, well, probably we did a lot of bad stuff too. And uh, that is like participating in the bombing of Dresden. Now you go to Putin. And while I'm not completely up to date in the stories, but I've heard stories like he's after the Germans, you know, that the Germans. Now, that's interesting in his background because I don't know the great details of his life. But I can tell you, if you go into his background, some of his family, uncles, his grandmother, others were killed during World War II. And they were obviously killed by Germans, uh, uncles who disappeared on the Eastern Front, never heard from again. Well, I doubt if the, the Soviets were killing them, I presume the Germans were, they were engaged in combat. That affects his mind and his image about those bad, bad, bad Germans out there. And somehow this has worked his way into the story that, and I can't even get the connection. I'm taking Ukraine because of the Germans. And this is being pitched to the Russian people, or I'm taking it because I don't like Nazis. So, I mean, this is how you can take stories and kind of twist and manipulate them to convince the population. We do know in normal propaganda in wartime, minimize your losses and maximize those of your opponent and your enemy. That's standard fare. 
I mean, I can tell revolutionary war statistics where this goes on. And, uh, you know, one side said 50 died, and the other side says 5,000 died in a particular conflict or battle. So while we're getting the story, which I think is accurate and responsible journalism, that thousands of Russian soldiers are, are dying in this because the war machine on the ground is bogged down in certain areas. The Russian people are being told this isn't really the case, and we're making these immense gains, and they can and look, and then they'll show them a picture. We just blew this city off of the map when, where they're not making the immense gains are really in cap, finally capturing the key in, in this kind of war. The key is to take the capital, Kiev. That was the key in a lot of wars all through time, as a matter of fact. They're not really getting a real picture. They're getting a distortion of the reality, and that convinces them we got to keep going. We got to break their will because they are what? Bad people. And I will say it's important to make the distinction in Nazi Germany, there were not the sort of protests that we're seeing of the Russian people of today. There is a huge, and thank God, and there is a huge breakdown in that propaganda. I am shocked at how many Russians are taking to the street to protest, knowing full well that they may end up either dead or locked somewhere where they'll never see the light of day again. But there are signi- there is significant pushback from the day-to-day Russians over this. This is a very, very, very delicate matter. And we have to be very careful about how we put our cards on the table because one statement can lead to appeasement, but another statement can lead in another direction that is moving up the scale from limited war to total war. And that's one of those real dangers that is out there uh, over time as the war continues. We don't know where this thing is gonna end, but we really have to be very careful in in what we say without appearing at the same time to be, well, okay, you go ahead and take it. and We'll worry about it two years from now kind of thing. Well, you said there's a misunderstanding of limited war versus total war. What are they, how are they different, and what are we looking at right now in Ukraine as opposed to Dresden? Okay, let me go way back in time, all right? Let's go. I'm ready for it. Go back to what was called the Thirty Years' War in Europe from 1618 to 1648. This was not a friendly war. It involved much of Europe. There are all sorts of issues, economic, religious, social, so on and so forth. It spreads all over the landscape, bottom line. When it finally ends in 1648 with the, I believe it's the Treaty of Westphalia, if I haven't mixed my treaties up on this because I do get them mixed up. And in 1648, take the body count. One third of Europe is dead. Now that's startling. So if the population, I'll make up the number is 60 million, 20, 20 million people are gone after 30 years of war and nothing has been settled of any consequence. This leads in turn to writing that a man by the name of Hugo Grotius, uh, and then later uh, Emmer de Vattel. I don't say their names very well. And he raises these issues and he said, we got to stop this. This gets to the matter of the civilian population. We killed a substantial portion of the civilian population. These were a bunch of soldiers out there fighting. We've got to separate warfare from the civilian population. In other words, get your armies out in the cornfield, get them organized and duke it out. That is sort of what is defined then and will become an ideal during the age of the enlightenment. Let them fight it out and that decide who the winner is. Well, that was the recommendation. Keep the warfare away from the general population. That's very limited warfare. The kings and the queens and the big shots and whatever can decide among themselves who gets this hunk of Germany or France or whatever it might be. What I'm trying to get around to saying here is that this is limited in the sense that it's not meant to be spread all over the population, but warfare has moved back toward that direction of 1618 and 1648 as we move the 19th into the 20th century. There are various reasons for this, but once you have certain technologies such as the airplane and the ability to bomb, or you have artillery pieces where you can shoot something and hit a target accurately, there's no way you can necessarily separate that from the population. And that's what's going on in the Ukraine. 
We see a hospital blown up. There's a case of a theater being blown up. I remember reading something about, I believe it was like 300 more people got killed in that particular incident, including children, if I'm remembering the right story. And we say, well, this is a tragedy, but this is movement beyond limited warfare. But that does not mean it's become total war. That's what total war is going to. In World War II in Dresden, you could bomb and destroy a city, but you couldn't blow up the world. So there are limitations. So World War II, total war is really destroying everything in sight, but you can't destroy everything. Total war becomes, uh, in the late 20th and into the early 21st centuries, it becomes a matter of, if we want to, we can finish the whole thing off and get it settled once and for all. So that's what it has become, at least in my mind. And that is, that is uh, again, from my point of view, I just hope we're not headed in that direction. And everybody who's listening, to, and everybody on the face of the earth should be hoping we can get this thing settled, we can get some sort of a diplomatic situation going so that we can go back to a state of peace. It's an existential question, not to get too philosophical, even though, I mean, we basically are. There is that cycle, right? Some people say history repeats itself, or history is a cycle, or all of those things. But we're talking about, you know, the 1940s now to here, where it seems to be on the precipice of something bigger happening. The echoes of what we saw in World War II and things of that nature seem to be coming back. I, yeah, I know you were talking about it. Like, what does this say about us, that we can't seem to learn these lessons and we keep ending up in the same place that we were? And you're talking about back in the 1600s, now it's... 2022, and we're having this same discussion about these things. And I hope this isn't too philosophical. One factor that every historian needs to take into consideration is, do people really change? Do they evolve over time? What evolves over time are cultural values, or social values, political values, technology, and warfare is an amazing story. I mean, they're throwing spears at each other back in Greek and Roman times. I'm exaggerating when I say that. It was pretty bad compared to what we're throwing out there today where you can shoot 10, 15 miles and blow away a building and kill 300 people. They couldn't do that, obviously. So this, this technological factor is very, very important in any kind of a, a study of war. But have the people that are launching the spears or launching the rockets or dropping the bombs from the planes, have those people changed? Is there something in the human temperament? And I'm concerned about that uh, from various points of view because there's a dictator type out there. And I'll give you Napoleon, late 18th, early 19th century, great warrior. But in terms of what he did to Europe, millions died. And then you've got Adolf Hitler. Joe Stalin was a, the sociopath of the sociopaths. We now have guys like Putin, but we can go to the minor levels and we can think of various dictators in various kinds of countries where the people are horribly depressed where they're treated like cattle at best or as slaves. It's just something there about humans, that some humans crave this kind of power, this kind of influence. Uh, I taught a course at West Point, one of the standard ones uh, called The Art of War, the first half of it. We covered Greek and Roman warfare all the way up to the year 1900. And then the second part of the course deals with the 20th century and it covers the big wars of the 20th and 21st century. We were doing a war twice a week. Warfare is endemic. Why is that? And one of the explanations is people have certain needs, have certain desires, have certain quest after power, after privilege, after fame, after whatever else it is, or they want to control all the money or whatever. And it's kind of a natural man concept, I guess we can say. It's there over and over and over again. Uh, and that's a bit of a frightening thought when you think about it, because maybe we're going to get this one settled, but I'm willing to bet the farm after this one is done within 10 years, we'll be into another one. I do recall, I think it was that class, because all of that is burned into my memory, of course. The conversation around just war and all of those things, I've always found that sooner or later, you can have an extremely intricate argument about are you the good guy are you the bad guy is this just but it seems like any sort of philosophy in that way falls apart when you're the good guy and the other guy's the bad guy 
And if everybody else is kind of buying into it, it all of a sudden becomes, you need to do whatever you need to do to win because that guy over there is evil. And that just type of thinking kind of, that's why it seems silly almost to even have these philosophies on war because they're so easily thrown out the door as soon as you say, well, I'm the good guy though, so I need to do whatever I need to do to win. Well, right now in World War II historiography, uh, more and more, the Allies are becoming the bad guys. And now in the history, what you do is you take a Dresden or let's say the bombing of Hamburg in 1943. You take these, these situations and my golly, I mean, what do you have? You have now an interpretation that this was unnecessary military activity. Now, that's really rethinking things. And that's, that's becoming more and more commonplace. You really didn't need to do all of this to win the war. Well, then um, I, I'll respond and say, just talk a little bit uh, more military thinking here. Proportionality, was this too far? This gets into Jewish and Bella. Were we killing people who shouldn't have been killed? Or were those people on the ground who were being killed? Weren't they really not just civilians? Weren't they perhaps uh, individuals who were supporting very effectively the uh, Nazi regime because in Dresden, for instance, you had like 120, 130 manufacturing establishments. And these are workers who are going to work every day, some of them uh, in slave-like form, but they're going to work every day. And they're building the machinery of war to keep that military activity going. And so these are the kinds of questions that really begin to come up. But if there was a just war, to use that term in the context of just war theory, it was World War II. And now, as always happens with historiography, it begins to people, well, wait a minute. And the farther we get away from events, we tend to forget certain things. We tend to emphasize this or that or whatever it is. And right now, the fact of the matter is that um, the Allies aren't looking as good as they used to. This is, goes back to your point about what direction do you look? How do you understand this? How do you study it? I have no doubt in my mind that World War II had to happen because we were up against some of the most evil forces in the history of humanity. And that while the Allies may have made some mistakes, they may have gone too far. They were doing it because they wanted to end all that killing that was going on. That was the end game in all of this. And now we talk about the killing that's going on in the Ukraine, and I don't know where the end game's going to be. But I do know that Putin doesn't really seem to care. He doesn't seem to care that his own soldiers are being killed. He doesn't seem to care that he's killing innocents on the ground. And it really then becomes a matter of how much will the world tolerate this without going to the extreme, which is we can end it all. And uh, that would be the ultimate irony of all of this from my point of view. You talking about revisionist history, it makes me think of one of my favorite people from World War II, which is Dwight Eisenhower, when he first laid eyes on a concentration camp and immediately told his staff, you need to record this, you need to put it on video, you need to write it down. I'm paraphrasing, but I believe he said, because I know one day some bastard will try and say it didn't happen. There you go. And that one of them turned out to be David Irving. One of the books that brought him to a lot of attention, I don't want to say fame, was his book uh, called Apocalypse Now, or whatever the title is, which is about the bombing of the Dresden, in which he consciously uses the Goebbels like to go back to propaganda figures. This was worse than dropping an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, uh, which is a far stretch uh, in terms of the body count, to make the point that not that many people were killed. And I don't understand why he's got so many people being killed. There's a little bit of inconsistency there. But this is part of doing history. Uh, we have to be very, very careful about what we do and what we say. The best historian is the investigative reporter who goes in and says, I want to find out what happened. I don't want to just prejudge it by looking backward through time. I got to go backward to the point in time where this started and study it forward. And that's how you find the best patterns out there. Well, Jim, I'd like to end it on this. couple of really quick questions just to see that you agree. Uh, number one, do we agree that Putin sucks? Yeah, no problem. And number two, go Ukraine, right? Right now, I'm all, re I'm all Ukraine. I'm just like a lot of good American folks out there. And uh, I am, as a gentleman, as a Christian, I'm praying for him. Because, and I'm praying for the world, too, at the same time. If we're not careful, we could ruin everything. 
Sounds good, Jim. Thanks for coming on again. There's so much more we could discuss, but this at least we're getting the discussion and participating in it. And I think that's very, very important is trying to bring just a little more broadened perspective to what's really going on out there in Hawaii. Well, you know you always have an open invite to come on back. Thank you. And I may take you up on that. All right, that is it for our special edition of the History Nerds United podcast. Jim Martin, thank you once again for coming on. Always happy to have you. Listen, let's wrap this up nice and neat with a bow. Go Ukraine, keep it up. See you later, nerds. Mm-hmm.